church family we're the rushes uh, we're doing great we've been really lucky we've both been healthy throughout this whole shutdown uh, we've been keeping in touch with our family our kids and we've used of course we the old time phone calls FaceTime we've done zoom uh, so we've stayed in touch with you know most of our family many of our friends uh, we had a, a really unique opportunity this week thanks to technology we um, we're blessed to have our middle son get married. Uh, he was married via the internet and uh, Dr. G and Pastor John uh, provided the ceremony, performed the ceremony, and uh, it was just super. It was attended by our kids' friends from all over, from Turkey, Great Britain, all over the States. We had a huge attendance online and everything just went smooth. Uh, it was a wonderful experience and we were so excited and. Uh, were it not for this shutdown, we certainly wouldn't would have never experienced anything like that. But we're so grateful that that it took place and that it was a big success. And uh, we're grateful to Dr. G. And we miss everybody. We love everybody, and we are super excited to be back uh, to church as soon as the doors open. So we love you guys. We miss you, and we hope to see you soon. Bye. Bye bye. Is it going? Testing one two three. Let's get this party started. Another beautiful day here at Shea Mayberry with Charles and Sharon Mayberry. We may maybe all be social distancing. Hey, including my niece, who a neighbor tried to deliver a piece of misdelivered mail, and she said, stay away, just throw it in the driveway, and someone will pick it up. We may be social distancing and staying away from crowds, but Christ is never far from us, never. He is always with us. Jesus is Lord and his church. That's you, us, and all his believers everywhere are alive and well. Psalm 46 tells us that God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. In Psalm 16, David said, I know that the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. We're always together in Christ, and we can't wait to see you again. Amen. Stay Thank well, and, and God, God bless. bless. Good morning. Welcome to the Church at the Beach. We're so happy that you're here with us today. We've been able to get excitement generated in our church body as you've turned in those home selfies. They are such a blessing. It really makes me feel warm and close. I hope you'll continue to do this. Thank you for coming today. I hope you enjoy our worship. Hey, what's up guys? Pastor John, Church at the Beach, student pastor, excited for uh, conversations that are happening to be able to open things back up soon, hopefully rather than later. Students, I know you're antsy. I know you're wanting to come back, and so we may have some things in the works that uh, you can maybe come, a couple you can come help clean up and do some things, and guys, just very excited about what's happening right now. So stay positive and keep praying. Bendiciones, Iglesia. Buen día. Blessings, Church. Good day. Es muy importante la familia. It's very important the family. Es importante orar juntos. It's important to pray together. Es muy importante it's la iglesia en familia. It's very important the church in family. Los amamos. We love you. Amamos su familia. We love your family. Y oramos por ustedes. And we are praying for you. Recuerda. Remember. Dios tiene un plan. God has a purpose. Con tu familia. With your family. Bendiciones. Blessings. Again, Ronnie, just one more time. Uh, 
Now this social distance is getting a little bit old. Good to be able to talk again, man. Good, good to see good you. Good to see you. Where are we at? Hey, we're at the church at the beach, man. This ain't the church at the beach. Yeah. Look around. A lot of changes. Oh, my goodness. I don't, wow, this is unbelievable, isn't it? Yes, it is. Well, God's been working in mysterious it ways while beautiful. we've been staying home. I mean, the change has been made. Uh, this has been changed up. Great job. I mean, outstanding. It's looking really good. It's looking really, really good. Uh, it's not done yet, but it's going to get better. It's going to get better. Wasn't it exciting? It's, you know, it's kind of easy. Sheep. We shall come rejoicing. Bring the sheep. Isn't this great? Hey, it's looking good. Man, this is unbelievable. I tell you what, our congregation is going to love this when they get back. Yeah, it's looking really, really nice in here. So much brighter. All looks new, fresh. what's happened while we've been gone. Yeah, there's been a lot of people working around here behind the scenes. Behind the scenes. And really dressing this place up. And I think people will really be impressed and really be happy. I tell you what, we, we, you'll probably see some of the video. We can probably name everything. But when they come, just look around, folks, and, 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 and the improvements. And it's, it's just it's the Spirit of the Lord working. Now. Hey, guys, it's great to see you. Great to be back with you again. It won't be very long now until they're going to turn us loose. And I think that we're all going to be very, very happy with what we've got going on. See y'all then. You know, folks, just keep a, a smile on your face and a song in your heart. And we'll be back praising the Lord in our sanctuary before you know it. Just keep that positive spirit. God loves you. And we can't wait to see you guys. Good morning. I'd like to take us back to about 1100 B.C. during the time of Gideon. The Israelites had turned their back on God, and so God allowed the Midianites to come in and take over the Israelites. And they had eaten all of their animals and stripped all their fields. And we see a time when Gideon is at the bottom of a wine press threshing wheat, which would have normally be done up high, but he wanted to keep it away from the Midianites. And so an angel of the Lord appears to Gideon and says, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Sir, Gideon replies, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? We could probably ask ourselves the same question today. If the Lord is with us, why is this coronavirus happening to us? Well, if you fast forward about a thousand years from there, you have the Apostle Paul. He's in Ephesus. He is preaching the true and living God. And you hear the story about Demetrius, who was a silversmith who made Artemis idols to sell. And Paul's preaching about the true and living God was affecting Demetrius' financial pocket. And so he tries to get rid of Paul and all his associates by taking them out and killing them, and they escape with their lives. So Paul writes about that situation from Acts 19. He writes about it further in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I thought I'd read a portion of that for you today. We think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure, and we thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God, who raises the dead. And he did rescue us from mortal danger, and he will rescue us again. We have placed our confidence in him, and he will continue to rescue us. You know, it reminds me about some friends that have gone through, life, gone through lifeguard training. And one of the important things they teach a lifeguard when he's going, he or she is going out to rescue a drowning person is don't get within an arm's distance of them. See, they're out there trying to survive. They're thrashing about and kicking about 
And if you get near them, they'll grab onto you and take you down with them. And so what they teach the lifeguard is to stay just an arm's distance away from them until that person settles down and realizes that their rescuer is there to help them. And when, then you can reach out to that person that's drowning and assist them and bring them back to safety. Maybe in this coronavirus we're going through, God's just an arm's distance away, waiting us for totally turn to him.
My Lord and my God, today we continue in post-resurrection experiences of Jesus, our study looking at those moments following his resurrection. I want to read to you today from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 24 through 31. Now Thomas, also called Didymus, which is also twin, one of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and I put my fingers where the nails were, and I put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, some of the different translations say eight days. But according to Jewish counting, it is literally one of our weeks. And so this is the first Sunday after the Easter Sunday, after Jesus appeared to the ten disciples in that room. It's one week later, and they're all in that same room, in that same house again, and Thomas this time is with them. And though the doors are locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Realize this is exactly the wording that was there in the previous text in verse 19. And then he said to Thomas, Thomas, put your finger here and see my hand. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting. Start believing. Literally, it says stop doubting and believe, but it's an invitation from Jesus for Thomas to move from one type of behavior to another. And so, really, stop doubting and start believing. Thomas said to him, without touching him, without doing anything other than just seeing the presence of the resurrected Lord, my Lord and my God. He declared it as though something compelled him from his internal soul that now he had both seen God in the flesh and it was his responsibility to both serve him and to follow him. And then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life through his name. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we need a fresh relationship with our resurrected Lord. So many things in our life turn us upside down. So many things bring fear and dismay to us. Things in life are more challenging and the future is less sure. So today, Father, we pray that you would come and you would reveal yourself to us just as you did to Thomas. And Father, today as we pray, we also pray for those in our midst that are sick and have loss. We pray for Chuck Rice and his recovery from a stroke and for Jerry Dodd as she battles with cancer. We pray for Amy McMillan and the loss of her father and for Brother Saul Williams, one of her deacons, struggling with cancer and some other illnesses with his respiratory system. We pray for Terry Hook and the good things that are happening in his treatment and for Susanna Bissell who has lost her father. Also for Linda Van Doren's grandson and then for our precious Miss Hess. We pray that our leaders would be filled with wisdom, that our churches would know how best to handle all the situations that are there today as this unique time is there to share the love of Christ. We pray for the vulnerability that's out there because of the virus, that, Lord, we would see it eradicated. 
And Father, we pray for those who are surely hurting because of unemployment and because of diminished resources. We ask all of these things in and through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A spiritual affirmation. My Lord and my God. On the lips of a man who's just been transformed by the presence of the resurrected Christ. What is it that we really know about this man named Thomas? Well, not a lot. He's mentioned a few times in Scripture. He is uh, obviously a twin. In fact, his name Didymus is the word for twin in both the Greek, in the Koine Greek, and in the Aramaic, which was the everyday language of the people of Jesus' first century community. And so we know he had that, but we also know that he's a person who's very pragmatic. He's a person who raises questions. But when he gets the answer, he's always willing to follow. And so there are five lessons today that I think we need to learn from the life of this man named Thomas. And certainly, I hope you, along with me, will reform our thoughts from doubting Thomas to believing Thomas. The first thing I want us to learn is that God gives us strength. The presence of Christ gave Thomas strength. In fact, if we look in John's Gospel, chapter 11 and verse 14, we find that Jesus has just raised Lazarus. And it's time for him to go back to Jerusalem and to go back to the house of Lazarus just outside of Jerusalem. And it's a very, very uh, difficult time and a very threatening time. And the disciples begin to urge Jesus not to go and saying, Lord, they just tried to stone you. And we find these words in verse 14. It says, So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. But, Jesus said, let us go to him. The first person to step forward was not Simon. The first person to step forward was not the Apostle John. The first person to step forward was the Apostle Thomas. Verse 16 says that this disciple who was ready in obedience to follow his Savior gives us these words. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, the twin, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go that we may die with him. Today, we move to point two, which is the fact that we learn a lesson that God listens to our questions. I don't know if you've ever been scolded for asking certain questions. I used to wonder about the question of my call to ministry. And I'll never forget hearing one of my professors say that doubt is an instrument to growth. I wonder today if you have some doubts about how things are. Well, let's look at that doubt and how it developed in the life of Thomas. First, there was a crisis in life. We've understood crisis well in these last weeks. It's not just in our world and in our community, but it's in our personal lives. And Thomas had such a crisis. Verse 24 again says, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. You might not think that was much of a crisis, but how would you feel if you were the only one left out? How would you feel if everyone else got to experience and you missed what occurred? That's what happened in the life of Thomas. It created a life crisis for him. In fact, the scripture tells us that they go on not only to tell him that Jesus was risen, but they demonstrate that excitement in his presence. And as we read, it says, So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. I don't know about you, but I don't like missing out on the big moments in life. Sometimes we're robbed of that. Sometimes we make deliberate choices that cause us to miss that. We don't know where Thomas was. We don't know why he was there. We don't know what he felt inside, whether it might have been guilt or it might be resentment. It might be a loss. But whatever it was, this life crisis brought 
to him the confession of the ten, and he felt left outside. This called for the proof that would be necessary for Thomas to believe that Jesus was truly raised from the dead. Look in verse 25, if you will, with me. So the other disciples, once having seen the Lord and told them this to, or told these things to, to Thomas, but he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and I put my hands into his side, I will not believe. Well, Christ listens to our questions. And I think when he showed up in that room on that second Sunday night, the one following Easter, he understood exactly why this man he had known well for three years would say such a thing. I believe there's a real lesson here for us to learn. And that lesson is that Christ heard the question of Thomas. Point number three, our third lesson to learn from Thomas is that community with Christ and with the body of Christ was absent from Thomas. And actually, the reverse of that is what we learn, and that is that we need to have that presence and that connection. In fact, we know in verse 24, everyone was there but Thomas. And we also know that it's vital that we be attached. Listen to the book of Hebrews as we go there. I'm going to ask you to turn, if you would, with me in your Bible. And there in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10 and verse 25, we find these words. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good needs. And that's kind of a question that the writer of Hebrews raises. And this is his response in verse 25. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day of the Lord approaching. Do you need encouragement today? I believe one of the lessons in the crisis that Thomas was in was that he needed the community and the community was absent from him. It might not have been intentional, but it nevertheless was absent. Notice he was unattached. He wasn't there in the three days after the crucifixion. He wasn't there in the presence of Christ for that entire week. And so he was unattached for 10 days. And he was uninformed. Nothing they said made logical sense to him. Nothing they said could answer the deep felt question that he had in his heart and all the things that might possibly have been driving that. And so he was uninformed. He was not with the disciples. Thus, I believe Thomas was misunderstood. I wondered sometimes, you know, do we need to call him Thomas the believer or Thomas the doubter? You know, there were times in his life like we read in the early part of the scripture, where he's the one that came to the forefront and said, let's go with him and die. He was the believing follower. But there are times in your life when things are upside down. There are times in your life when crisis grips you, as we've been talking about, and it changes how you respond in your circumstances. He was defensive. You could almost hear it in his language. He was very dogmatic about what was necessary. I think he might have been angry. He very well could have been hurt. He might have been afraid, which would have brought that external response from him. He may have been proudful. And some arrogance could have filtered in. But I'm so glad that Jesus understands. He understands our questions. He knows where they come from. He knows that when he's present, we are at our best and our strength is there. And he understood that. That's why he gave us the body of Christ. We need each other. Just as Thomas needed his community, we need ours. Everywhere I go, there are people telling me I miss being at church. I can't wait till we gather back together. And, you know, we've encouraged people to do things and uh, to step outside the box. Well, 
I had an interesting stepping outside of the box this week where one of the families came and said, Pastor, do you think you could do a virtual wedding? I never realized what it was going to turn into, but it was a virtual international wedding. We had 50 families from different places all over the world. Turkey, all over the United States, and right here at the beach. And we did a virtual wedding. And we talk about reaching out and helping people and doing things for people. Man, I was blessed just the other day. I went over to Publix to pick up some drugs and some things that we needed. And uh, I decided, because it's sushi day for $5, that I would go by, visit with one of our families who run that part of the Publix store. And uh, I could tell there was an excitement in Boxen's face. And, and so she said, well, when you get through, come back and see me. And her English is somewhat broken. And I said, yes, I'll go and get the rest of my things. And I did. And, and I, I met her at the front of Publix. And she came up. And, and I, she's done this before me, for me before. And she was, I think, going to give me a, as a gift the sushi that I bought. Well, she, she bought what I ordered plus one more of what she knew I liked. And then she began to make this commotion. And, uh, and before I knew it, she bought all of my groceries. And I thought, well, what a gift. And she says, Pastor, my pandemic gift to you. You know, there's some great things that you and I can do for other people if we'll just use our imagination and our resourcefulness. What a blessing it is to have such. And so, this morning, I want to tell you that we need each other as the body of Christ. When we don't have each other, we're unattached, we're uninformed, and quite often what that does within us makes us misunderstood. So the third lesson we learn is we need the presence of Christ and we need one another. In part four, we move from the strength that we need that uniquely comes from God and the understanding that he gives us in the midst of crisis and the power of both his presence and the presence of others to our fourth lesson for today, and that is the lesson that the Holy Spirit comes to change us. God is interested in coming to you and to me where we are. On that particular day, he came to Thomas right where he was, in the midst of his crisis, in the midst of his ambiguities in the midst of however he was feeling to make such rash statements as he made, God came right then and right there and reached out and said, Thomas, I believe Thomas could hear the love of the resurrected Christ. I believe he sensed that Jesus really wanted to help him pass this moment. In fact, it must be true because it was so evident that Thomas that when he made the observation that the Lord was in his presence, he never reached out to touch him. He never did any of those things that we often are told that Thomas did. In fact, he moved directly from unbelief to declaration of belief. My Lord and my God. In fact, his observation took him into a moment of transformation. Only the Holy Spirit can do this in our life. He reaches down and he allows us to sense that God can make a difference and change in our life. That God can answer our questions and God can settle our doubts, but we have to put our faith and trust in Him. And the minute that this occurred, by the transformation of the Spirit of God, He makes that great declaration. Maybe one of the strongest, if not the strongest statement about Christian faith ever made up to this day about the deity of Christ and the fact that He ought to be the Lord of our life. My Lord and my God. I wonder, have you learned that lesson today to allow yourself to be touched by the power and the presence of God through His Holy Spirit? The fifth and final lesson that we learned from the life of Thomas today is the fact that when God and the Holy Spirit comes into our life, He comes to save 
and to assist us. In fact, John talked about the coming of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said, unless I go to the Father, the Spirit can't come. But when He does come, He will be the one who comes alongside to assist. The word for Holy Spirit is the Greek word parakletos, and that's exactly what He does. He doesn't come to do it for you. He comes to go through it with you. And that is what Thomas would experience. And while there is that concrete Christ standing in his presence, it's the conviction that Thomas felt about that Christ. In verses 29a and b, we find this true. And let's go and look at our text and see what happens <coughs> there in the life of Thomas. Then Jesus said and told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Well, that's a straightforward fact. Because Thomas had seen him. Now, folks, I don't want you to think this is just physical observation. When Thomas saw him, it was far more than physical. It was a soul sighting of Jesus. It transformed Thomas from the inside out. And what was demanded of him ceased to matter at all. Now all he wanted to do was claim him as God and serve him as Lord. You know, when Jesus comes and saves us, it transforms us. In fact, he does this by sending his Spirit to us today. The second half of that verse kind of deals more with you and me than with Thomas. Notice what he said. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now I thought to myself, is this John? Could John be saying this? You know, he was the first to believe. He got to the empty tomb and when he realized that the tomb was empty, it says he saw and believed. But I believe John is too humble for that. That heart of the beloved disciple that was recognized by our Lord would never be so proudful. I think that what we're having here in this text is we have a word from Jesus to you and me that when the Spirit comes and He touches your life and He touches my life through the dynamic power of His presence, He convinces us, you know, of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And then He allows us the opportunity to turn from our sin and turn to Him for salvation. And so the sending spirit, the convicting spirit of God, becomes invitational. As people saw those disciples and the others that were there, what had happened in the life of Thomas, they realized he grabbed a hold of a truth that they had not yet fully embraced. And they were invited to do the same. And Jesus knew way back when he was teaching in the uh, Sermon on the Mount that you and I as believers would be that same presence in the lives of unbelievers. He said, we're the salt of the earth. We're the light of the world. We're that which lends flavor to life. We're that which points people in the right direction. And if you and I will live and serve our Lord as the declaration of Thomas, was that he was going to do, it becomes invitational. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. I know Thomas didn't write that, but the scripture tells us he lived it. He found that he was stronger when he was in the presence of Jesus. He found that his questions, as complex and confusing as they were, could be answered. He realized his great need for community. He knew that God was able to transform him from darkness to light, not just in a regenerating process, but an ongoing sanctifying process. And when he allowed that to occur in his life, it made his very presence invitational. Isn't that what Paul says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. My Lord and my God, what a great testimony of transformation that compelled the very soul of Thomas to tell us about what God and Christ had done for him and we could learn those great lessons from his life. 
I wonder if you know Christ as Thomas came to know him fully in the story today. If not, let me invite you to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Pray this prayer with me. Father, I thank you so much that when we least expect it, you show up in our life. And you're there to offer us the opportunity to be transformed into the very likeness of your Son. I pray if a person today has felt that and sensed that by the power of your Spirit, they would right now confess that they are a sinner. They would ask Jesus to forgive them of their sin and ask him to come in and be their Lord and Savior. Bless them now in their new salvation walk. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being a part of our worship here at the Church at the Beach. We look forward to seeing you again next week.